Hi guys, this is Meg Tudor Berry and welcome to my channel. In today's video, we're going to be talking about PV loops. We'll start by looking at a normal PV loop and then um, talk about some pathology. So let's look at a normal PV loop. The first thing you want to do is look at your axes. So on your x-axis, you have left ventricular volume. On your y-axis, you have left ventricular pressure. Okay, um, so I like to start from point A. Point A is my end systolic volume. So let's say it's about 50 ml ESV. Remember that ESV is whatever little volume that's left behind from the previous cycle. Okay, so that's ESV. So that's what we start with. And once we have our ESV, we can start our filling phase. Remember, with the, for the filling phase, I need my mitral valve to be open so blood can come down and fill the ventricles. So point A is also where the mitral valve opens. And then we go from point A through C, increasing in volume without any change in pressure. So this is my diastole or my filling phase. Once I'm done filling, the mitral valve will close. And at point C, let's say it's about 120 ml, this is my end diastolic volume. It's the final volume in the ventricle um, at the end of diastole, so about 120 ml, okay? And this is where the mitral valve will be closed. Remember that this final volume is also called the preload in the heart. So once the mitral valve is closed, um, the left ventricle needs to push the blood out into the aorta right but that doesn't happen instantaneously there's a there's a brief period when both the aortic valves and the mitral valves is closed and our ventricle goes through this period of isovolumetric contraction what happens during this period is that the ventricle is constantly increasing is con is contracting and increasing left ventricular pressure and as soon as left ventricular pressure equals or exceeds the pressure of the aorta, so aortic pressure, that's when the aortic valve opens, okay? So we go through a period of isovolumetric contraction, and you can see that here because the volume doesn't change because the blood can't leave, um, and but the pressure in the left ventricle increases. At point D, left ventricular pressure exceeds aortic pressure, and this is where the aortic valve opens. This work that the left ventricle does in order to open that aortic valve, that's called our afterload. Okay. So once the aortic valve is open, we can start our systolic phase or the ejection phase. So this is my systole. This is where the left ventricle is actively pushing the blood out of the aorta. So the left ventricle volume, if you can see, um, decreases. We go from about 120 ml to about 50 ml. The point of highest pressure is also called our systolic blood pressure. Okay. Um, and then once we're done with the ejection phase, the aortic valve will close um, and the blood that we're left behind will be our end systolic volume. And just like we had an isovolumetric contraction phase, there will also be an isovolumetric relaxation uh, phase. So isovolumetric relaxation phase. And then we'll start the cycle all over again. So stroke volume um, is the difference between our end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. So in this case, it would be 120 minus 50 ml. And remember that the area under this curve, so all of this area here, let's make this blue, is our stroke work. Okay, so um, this is what a normal PV uh, loop looks like. One thing I want to talk about is this ESPVR line. This ESPVR line d is dependent on contractility, or it's representative of the contractility of the heart. Remember that when contractility increases, the slope of the ESPVR will be higher, so it'll have a greater slope. If the contractility decreases, the slope of ESPVR, the line, would decrease with it. And what are some things that can increase or decrease contractility? So let's write that here. 
So things that can have a positive effect on contractility. One thing remember is a greater preload. Because remember, if you fill the ventricle more, the ventricle stretches more and the inotropy or the contractility will be higher. Okay, it's the Starling's law. So more preload, more contractility. But also remember your um, sympathetic system can come in and increase your contractility. What are some things that have a negative effect on um, contractility? So a lower preload. So if you fill the heart less, the muscles will stretch less um, and your contractility will be uh, lower and you'll have a uh, decreased slope of ESPBR. And also your parasympathetic system. Um, can have a negative effect on your contractility. And just to show you um, if this is our normal ESPVR line, if the curve is like that, this is a higher slope versus if the curve ever changes to something like this, this would be a lower slope, um, which would represent lower contractility. Okay, so that's what a normal uh, PV loop looks like. And um, we should move on to um, the pathology. So let's start with aortic stenosis. Remember in aortic stenosis, your aortic valve um, is stenosed and it's harder for the left ventricle to push out blood. So less blood goes through the aorta and my left ventricle has to work harder to push the blood out, okay? So what we see is the afterload increases, right? You can see that the amount of work that the left ventricle has to do is much more, right? So the afterload would significantly increase in aortic stenosis. And like we said, the left ventricle is pushing out less blood. So we only are able to push out, let's say, half of the blood that we, um, that we um, of the end diastolic volume. So the end diastolic volume is about 120. We're only pushing out about, six, um, let's say, 80 instead of a normal 50 milliliters, okay? So your end systolic volume increases because you're left with more blood and because you're pushing out less edv is almost same to slightly increased and the stroke volume remembers the difference and the stroke volume decreases what are some heart changes we see with aortic stenosis remember when um, the left ventricle has to work harder we have we see this thing called concentric hypertrophy in the walls of the left ventricle this is when the walls of the left ventricle get really thick Okay, they get really bulky and thick, and this is what we call concentric hypertrophy. With concentric hypertrophy, the sound associated is an S4. Okay, it's a late diastole sound. And I like to think of it as, um, you know, when you already have lots of water in a bucket, and you like try to throw more water onto an already full bucket, that's the sound of an S4, okay? So what happens when you get um, um, concentric hypertrophy is that the chamber of the heart becomes smaller. So your bucket is smaller. It holds less water to begin with, right? And if you're trying to squeeze, uh, push more blood onto it, uh, you're going to hear that S4. The murmur associated with aortic stenosis, and I think we all know this uh, mnemonic, so it's aortic stenosis systolic murmur. Okay, it will be a crescendo decrescendo type murmur. I actually have a really nice uh, video um, that I'll be sharing a link to in the description of this video. This I it's it's great to understand the different heart sounds and the different murmurs. Okay, let's look at aortic regurg. Remember, aortic regurg is when your aortic valve is flop, floppy and leaky, so a lot of the blood regurgitate back regurgitates back into the ventricle. Okay, so what happens when you get regurgitation, your end diastolic volume would always be higher, right? Because all that blood comes back and plops back into the ventricle. So your end diastolic volume is very high. Your end systolic volume is also higher than normal, and you can see that here. But the systolic volume in this case, it increases quite a bit because the increase in end diastolic volume is much greater than the slight increase in our end systolic volume. Um, the changes that we see with aortic regurg, remember when all the blood plops back into the heart, here we have a, a type of volume overload, right? It's not that the heart has to pump harder, it's just that it's filling up 
more than it needs to. So when, when we see a volume overload problem, the type of hypertrophy we see is an eccentric or dilated hypertrophy. And the heart sound with an eccentric hypertrophy is an S3. And I just like to think of it like that. So if we have like a giant bucket and water like plops into the bucket because this is an early diastole sound, S3 is an early diastole. So think of filling the bucket in the early phases and that water is going to make a splosh sound um, at the base of this uh, you know big empty bucket and that's your s3 okay and the murmur uh, for aortic regurg will be the opposite of um, aortic stenosis so this would be a diastolic murmur okay one of the really important things we see with aortic regurg is that because all the blood, a lot of the blood falls back into the ventricle, um, the diastolic blood pressure actually, which is the, the blood pressure out in the arteries, um, it decreases quite a bit, okay? Because our cardiac output in a sense decreases. The systolic blood pressure remains about the same. So our pulse pressure, which is the difference between the systolic minus diastolic, um, this difference would increase. Right, so because let's say this stays about 120, but our diastolic, you know, falls down to um, instead of 80, it falls down to 60. So the difference would increase, right? So that's one thing we see with aortic regurg. Okay, moving on to mitral regurg. So mitral regurg is when the mitral valve regurg is floppy and leaky. So when this heart, when this left ventricle is in the systole and trying to push out blood through the aorta, now the blood is actually going two directions. It's going back into the atrium and it's also going into the aorta, okay? So one of the things that's really interesting with mitral regurg is that the total stroke volume, right, increases because more blood ends up leaving the heart, but the apparent stroke volume is actually low because yes, more blood is leaving the left ventricle, but only a part of it is getting into the aorta. A lot of it is actually going back into the atrium. So the apparent stroke volume of how much actually goes into the aorta is less than it would normally be. Um, and in this, you can see your end diastolic volume again is quite increased because um, this is a regurgitation and the, vo uh, the blood will fall back and essentially come back to the ventricle. Uh, but the end systolic volume is much lower because we said the ventricle is pushing more blood out, right? So like we said, the total stroke volume has increased, the ventricle is pushing more blood out. And again, this is because of Starling's um, law. So when more blood is filling the ventricle, it's pushing more blood out, but not all of it is going into the aorta. And that's why the apparent stroke volume is lower. So in this case, ESV also decreases and the stroke volume again would be quite um, increased and remember the murmur you remember misses this is the acronym so this is a systolic murmur because it's during this the 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 pathology is during this the pushing phase of the systole the sound again because it's a volume overload in the left ventricle every time you see a volume overload you always see s3 which is early diastole. And the heart changes again because there's volume overload would be an eccentric or dilated um, hypertrophy. Okay, and the last one is mitral stenosis. Mitral stenosis is pretty interesting because it doesn't really affect the left ventricle at all. The mitral valve, when it becomes stenosed, is actually the left atria that gets enlarged because it starts to hold on to more blood, okay? So it's, the, the problem really what we see is a left atrial enlargement um, for mitral stenosis. And um, in terms of our EDV, ESV, remember that it, it's, it's getting harder to push the blood down into the ventricle. So our end diastolic volume will be low and systolic volume will be low stroke volume would be low um, and afterload also because of starling spores were not filling enough so we won't be pushing hard enough so every, it, it looks like it, mitral stenosis looks very much like a normal 
PV loop because like we said, PV loop represents left ventricular volumes and pressures. So in terms of the shape, it's, it looks very normal. It's just that everything has been shifted um, to the left, to lower volumes. That's the only thing we see with mitral stenosis. Uh, and because it's not uh, any kind of hypertrophy in the ventricle, there is no sound associated. There's not an S3, not an S4 associated with mitral stenosis. Um, but there is a murmur though, and mitral stenosis, remember, is a diastole murmur. So it's a diastolic murmur. It's the opposite of mitral regurge. And it should make sense because it this would be a problem in the filling phase when we're trying to fill um, the left uh, ventricle. So that is everything. Hopefully this helps. Um, thank you for your time.